About a year ago, I was at the dentist getting my teeth cleaned by a wonderful dental assistant named Maria. She was in her 50s, she was from Mexico, and she was highly inquisitive. She was asking me all kinds of questions about my family, where I lived, and then she asked me what I did for a living. And I told her that I was a healing facilitator. And then her eyes perked up, mainly in curiosity. But then she started to tell me and open up with me about things that she's going through in her life. Some of her health concerns. She told me that she was having trouble with her digestion. She had chronic pain in her pelvis. And that her body and her joints just hurt everywhere. And that she was just tired. I then asked her, tell me about your childhood. What was it like for you to grow up? Then she said to me, childhood? I never had one. Since the age of seven, she was working in the fields with her parents just to put food on the table. And she had never stopped since then. And her life was just taking a toll. And then she asked me, is there any remedies or modalities or any things that I could help her alleviate her symptoms? And I said, yeah, there's something you can do. You need to go tell that seven-year-old girl that you love her. And you need to give her the love now that she wasn't able to get then. Maria eventually just broke out into tears and she started to sob. She got up and left the room. And I was in the dentist table with the dentist for about two minutes. It was pretty awkward. It's kind of like, this is kind of interesting. But Maria eventually did come back in the room and they did clean my teeth. But Maria never asked me another question again. I tell you the story because this is a perfect example of the potency of our past. Our childhood memories are extremely powerful and the emotions that are attached to them are deep and they don't get weaker with time. They actually get stronger. There's a very sane reason why people are reluctant to heal. Because healing requires us to confront and include our past while peering is all about removing or avoiding it. If we've had a positive upbringing, then the emotions attached to that upbringing are clearly beneficial. But if it hasn't been that positive, the process can be extremely scary. But in the words of Joseph Campbell, in the cave that we most fear to enter hides our greatest treasure. My earliest memory is waking up in the pitch dark in excruciating pain. When I was a toddler, I'd get these chronic ear infections and they got so severe that actually both of my eardrums burst and I had to have tubes put in just to drain the fluid. I'm 39 years old now, but my body still remembers the feeling of it just like it was yesterday. Waking up with the feeling of someone stabbing me in the ear with a screwdriver and the sound of drowning underwater because my head was so full of inflammation. These were really tough memories for a toddler. However, on the other side of these, there was something real special. After a whole night of screaming and crying, I remember a morning when I was with my mom and she put her warm, loving, gentle hands over my ears. And in that moment, I went from excruciating pain and terror to the safest that I've ever felt in my life. And I go to sleep. Experiences are interesting because on one side you have terror and pain and on the other side, safety and serenity. A few years later, I've experienced another kind of pain, but this one was different. This one was less physical. When I was nine years old, my dad went to prison. 
And I moved from Washington State down to the Deep South, Alabama. And up until that point, I had never questioned the color of my skin or what that even meant or why that was even relevant. My dad was black, my mom was white, and I was both of them, and it worked, and I'm proof. But when I moved to Alabama, there were some things I noticed. They were a little different from where I moved from, and one of the things was that there weren't too many light chocolate kids like myself. The other thing was, I didn't see many black and white kids mingling together socially. Yeah, sure, like a PE class or after school football, but at lunchtime and in between classes, I didn't see any, any social, social mingling, which was interesting. But hey, I was nine years old, I was in fourth grade, whatever, you know, let's start the show. And on the first day of school, I was, I was standing in the bus line at the end of the day, ready to go on the bus, and I started talking to this older black kid that was next to me. I don't remember what I said, I was just jibber jabbering, but I do remember him punching me in the face. This was the first time I ever been punched by a fist, and I remember crying, and I ran off to the principal who was out in the yard with us, and I told him, I was like, hey, this kid punched me in the face, and I was just crying, and it's totally violated. And I remember the principal was looking at me, and he's like, looking at my face, he's like, you don't look like you got punched that hard. I think you need to go back to the bus line. And disappointed and frustrated, I did. That was my first day of school, fourth grade. A couple days later, I was in the bathroom just going to pee at the urinal. And another older black kid came in. And while I was peeing, he came up to me and he called me a honky and he punched me in the face. But this time, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my teacher. I definitely wasn't going to tell the principal. I didn't tell my mom. I just kept it all inside and I internalized it. And like any person trying to make the best sense of their life experience, the sense that I could come up with was that it was my fault that my dad was in prison. And that's why people that were his color were calling me names and punching me in the face. And what did I do? I disconnected from my own blackness. I disconnected from that side of my own identity. And this was the beginning of a cascade that I would take with me in through my adult life. A few months later, we moved up from Alabama to northern Wisconsin. And now the dynamic shifted. See, I wasn't just the, the lighter kid. I was the darkest kid in the entire town, not just the school. And now I got people the same color as my mom calling me the N-word to my face. And what did I do? I disconnected. But now I disconnected from my whiteness. And it wasn't so much about the color. It was the identity that I got from both of my parents because I didn't know how to reconcile my life experience with these kids and socially. And I became passive. I had a serious identity crisis. I avoided people. I especially avoided standing up for myself because it seemed that every single time I got into an argument with one of my peers, it would somehow get racial. So here I am becoming antisocial. I start developing into a young teenager. Hormones kick in. So does the anger, so does the confusion, so does the frustration. I'm a boy that needs attention from his dad. Dad's in prison. I have really unhealthy attention-seeking habits. And four years later, seven schools later, and four states later, my dad finally gets out of prison. And I moved back to Washington State to be with them, and I'm so excited. I'm like, I finally get to get my life back. I get to go back to when I was nine years old, and I finally get to get my life back. But the reality of it is, life wasn't the same, and I wasn't the same. I was angry, I was growing, I was aggressive, almost grown. 
And that's actually what ended me, what caused me to get into in-school suspension to stay in eighth grade. And I remember my dad was gonna pick me up at school and I was just kind of apathetic because I got in a lot of trouble and I was like, whatever, he's just gonna yell at me, it doesn't really matter. But as we were walking out to our car through the gym, my dad did something to me that I will never ever forget to this day. He put his hand on my shoulder. In that moment, my back straightened, my shoulders relaxed, I lifted my head up, and I felt the most confident that I'd ever felt in my entire life that day. I was capable, I was validated. All those years, all the N words, all the other discrimination, the punches, just gone instantly. My dad was Zeus and I was Hercules. And he did it without saying a simple word, just by touch. My dad died four years later. He never got a chance to know the impact that that made in my life. He never got a chance to see the man that I grow into today. And he never got a chance to meet my beautiful family and see the grandchildren. But every single time I put my hand on my kids' shoulders, I know how much it matters. These memories I share with you are extremely emotional for me. They harbor an ancient pain, but they also bear a special gift. And that's the gift of touch. My mother used her touch to influence my young nervous system to shift from a state of fear and terror to safety and ease. My father used his touch to influence my posture to shift from being passive and apathetic to being present and proud. And today I use my touch to help my practice members shift from a life of survival to a life of self-discovery and personal growth. <laughs> Studies show that just by straightening our posture, we can reduce up to 40% more serotonin Studies also show that just by making light touches to the tissue overlying the spinal cord can cue our nervous system into reorganizing the entire body. I use my touch to help people heal. But healing is not about fixing anyone's problems. And it's not about making people's problems go away. Healing is about including our problems into the solution and becoming whole. And this means allowing the emotions of our past to harmonize with the human being that we are today. The caves of our past are no joke. The monsters that live there are very real, but so is the treasure. The purpose of the monsters is to keep the hero out. But the purpose of the treasure is to draw the hero in. In life, we are either pushed forward by the fear of what we don't want, or we are pulled forward by the love of what we do.